Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to hear more about educational technology, some um, digital tips from JC today, and artificial intelligence. Um, we're glad that you're here for this first um, para Zoom meeting of the 2023-24 school year. Yes, thanks for having me on, Steph, and hello, everyone. I'm super excited to share some ed tech updates and tips. Um, we wanted to start with the sentiment um, that we are just so grateful for all the work that you do. Um, you matter so much, and I know that we don't always hear it as much as we should, and we've had a couple trainings recently at the ECU that just um, solidified how important the role of um, those in the education system are. So thank you for the work you're doing and thank you for tuning in and watching this, um, watching this para update so that you can best serve students with some maybe newfound information. So I think I've told you all many, many times that um, I never would have made it in the classroom without my amazing paras, especially those first few years. Holy cow. Um, you are superheroes and you're, you mean so much to the students and to the teachers and thanks for all that you do. Um, this topic today, by the way, came from the surveys that um, were filled out during the August full day um, para trainings this summer. So um, thanks for the feedback and giving us a topic that you want to know more about. Yes, awesome. We um, today will look at just increasing our awareness of some technology um, situations and then explore more of the capabilities within AI. And I guess before that, we'll look at some uh, best practices with password management and how that can help us to be safe online and then consider our next steps. So with this information, where do we go from here? So we'll look at what, so what, and then now what? Um, if we haven't met, I'm JC Palmer. I'm the instructional technology facilitator for ESU8. So this is my third year on the um, professional development team. You're welcome to email me anytime with questions or when I'm out in the um, schools. If you see me and have tech related questions, you're welcome to grab me and I am a resource to help. And I think most of you know me, I'm Steph Lundgren. Um, I've been with the ESU for 11 years now. I think this might be our sixth or seventh year, uh, maybe seventh year um, doing para trainings. Uh, we love our days with you guys. So um, again, like JC said, always reach out with questions. It might be something that uh, maybe um, you know isn't a topic for something we're offering this year, um, but we can help get you some resources um, on that topic. I know one year I had someone reach out and just say, hey, my staff's just kind of down in the dumps. The people I'm working with, I need a mood booster. And so I was able to offer up a book that really um, was meaningful. So um, we're always looking to be in touch with you and to hear what's going on in schools. Awesome. Yes, you do great work. Let's um, jump right into the password um, best practices. So these are some tips to think through when we're managing all the different accounts that we have. So it might be email, it might be bank accounts, it might be um, like your personal world of things and your uh, accounts that you see online. And these tips, hopefully you can use as an adult and maybe you pass them along to not just students, but those, um, those outside of the um, education world that could use um, reminders on some of these concepts. So Managing passwords, our first tip, uh, and some of these are basic, but it's to use unique passwords. So oftentimes we would, pref it, human nature may prefer to use a consistent password across several platforms, but one of the best tips is to actually have a unique password per sign-in account, um, because then if you were to be hacked or get somebody who's found out that password information to one, they're not going to be able to access all of the other accounts that are associated with you because they're unique per, um, per account. So that is the first tip to prevent um, unauthorized people from accessing your resources. Uh, second tip, complexity matters. So a lot of sites prompt this already, but um, use a mix of upper, lowercase, letters, numbers, symbols, and um, make it so that it wouldn't be um, 
wouldn't be atypical or obvious with a, a very simple word and a very simple, like, I know that they say that an exclamation point at the end of a password is the most common um, symbol that gets added to passwords. So per potentially consider a different symbol to incorporate a little bit more complex password. Um, tip three, so avoid common phrases. So using the word password for your password or like password one, two, three, those are um, pretty common in the sense that they could be easily guessed. Um, using your name is another one to avoid. Uh, some sites already have that built in where if you try to set your password as one of those things, it will say, mm, try again. Um, but if it doesn't prompt you to pick something else, just know that that is the best practice to try to avoid like just really generic terms of that nature. Um, number four, instead, you could consider using a passphrase instead of a password. So something that's a little bit longer or more memorable, a uh, string of words together. Um, one idea that I heard was to um, consider like a positive affirmation to become your password or passphrase. So, you know, when we have to continually type this passphrase over and over and over and over, might it then be something good that we want to fill our brains with something good, like a positive affirmation or like a little um, memo to ourselves. That's like a boost that we hear every time we're typing it. So mm. like Paris are valuable. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I help one grade that the teacher said it for the students. It's like, we are capable or something like that. It was for younger kids or I can't remember we are smart or it was something like just reaffirming their abilities mm -hmm. and right make it something that's a little harder to remember remember that way or a little harder to guess and then of course add the complexity with some symbols in there as well mm -hmm. um tip number five enable two-step um verification so this is something that many workplaces maybe have, or schools may have rolled out that if you'd like to have, for example, your email access on a phone, you've got to have two-step verification on phones because it adds that layer of security where um, someone can't just pick up the phone and check email. You've, they've got to like log into the phone and then log into the email. Um, so I just had this happen. I got a new device oh, and yes. um, I got a new computer and I was, um, uh, kind of logging into Google and things like that at home on this computer. And it made me validate it on my phone or on my other computer that it was actually me. Yes, that's a, yeah, it's, it can be at first when we get used to doing that, I know it can seem cumbersome or slows you down to have to like go get your phone and double check and like push yes or all the steps to make sure you can get in but really it is there to protect us and keep our content safe so it's worth setting up on personal apps or like shopping accounts and things like that as well that aren't necessarily school related because it can um, protect your financial information a little bit better too if that if it gives you that option okay tip number six um regularly update passwords so I'll say recommended actually every three months um, for really sensitive information, maybe like your email or bank account information. Um, and okay, is my screen share? I'm moving the video across the screen on my computer. Hopefully it didn't. Never mind. Okay. I I know I'm sharing my screen, so sorry to interrupt here. I just um, moved the video picture of where our pictures are at on the screen for me so I could read the screen better. So I apologize if it's been overlapping. Nope, we don't see that. So Okay, perfect then. Um, anyways, the, every three months and every six months for other, other websites, I know that typically like we hear people will only update when they forget or they'll only update... Um, Maybe I would recommend at least annually on some of those sites to to try to keep your passwords current, um, potentially tie this password updating process to another time of year that you're doing something regularly. So like the smoke alarms with the time change type of thing, or uh, maybe it's like quarter when the quarter ends or quarter break, then that's a signal to you to update passwords or uh, the seasons change just so four times a year we're updating our passwords. So Steph, have it's any the craziest things that um, 
that are password protected and then get hacked. Like my allrecipes.com account. Like why would someone want to even care to hack True. that but they did and messed it all up? So yes. Yeah. It's like, and if they get access to one thing, then it makes you nervous that they'll get access to another. Mm -hmm. So um, this too, I guess I, I often think about email and banks and stuff. Know that social media is a prime, um, no, you're okay. Prime example of where they might look for um, the availability to get into your accounts and find information too. So uh, remember the social media accounts to update regularly as well. Um. Okay, tip number seven. So be aware of that uh, spam request. So this is kind of what we were just talking about with like online social media or email um, and avoid sharing passwords. So anything that comes through that is um, fear prompting. So trying to scare you into like XYZ is going to happen or this much money is going to be withdrawn or any um, fear prompting verbiage is probably a red flag that it is spam. And, or if it sounds almost too good to be true, that would be another example of an email or a, a communication to be leery of. And especially most sites are not going to directly email you and reach out for your password information. So just avoid sharing your password directly with any, um, with any buddy that's reaching directly out to you. Yeah, like last week, um, we got one for um, a charity event that I help run. Um, we had a, an email saying, oh, your this account on Facebook will be deactivated within 24 hours, you yes. know, if we don't send something. And I had to tell my, um, you know, co-lead on that, uh, on that event that no, that was just, that's a scammer. Um, but also my parents were just talking about, you know, those Amazon delivery messages you get, you have an Amazon deliver. We're trying to deliver this to you. Well, if you didn't order anything, then you shouldn't be giving out any information and you should log into your own account on Amazon to see, hey, did I order that? Yes, that's awesome. And I, along those lines too, if someone reaches out and says they're with a certain company needing your information, um, reach back out directly by finding their number or contact information in a different way, or like you just said, and log into their account. Yeah. Don't take the, don't take the link that they give you or the phone number that they give yes. you on the phone. Um because that will be a scam one too. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. So we've, we've shared some tips here. Um, let's reflect then ask ourselves, uh, what is something you've heard that is resonating about your own password management? Um, or what might be your first or next step after hearing these tips? So we'll just look back through them briefly real quick here. So um, using a unique password per site, uh, make them complex, avoid common phrases, maybe consider a longer passphrase, that, passphrase that's an affirmation, um, use two-step verification, update those passwords regularly, and then avoid any spammy requests. So, so if you're watching this recording, you might just pause the video for now and have a discussion with the people in your room if you're with others. Um, and uh, or brainstorm on your own the answers to these questions. Awesome. My then, next step is that I need to switch a couple passwords. I um, tend to fall back to something that's very common and I don't need to do that. Um, I need to um, switch it up. And um, some of my passwords are very old. Mm -hmm. I had that takeaway through digging into this training and a couple others that they've shared this with. It's like, I need to be, have a better system for updating more regularly, not just like, if I can't remember or not just if mm -hmm. it, right. I need to intentionally um, update those. And I was using annually, but I probably need to do even more frequently than that. So yeah, thanks for sharing and uh, continue those conversations in your rooms. If you're watching this with a group later. Uh, let's move on, though, into our um, big topic of artificial intelligence. So in education, this is a big uh, trending topic, and we um, initially brought it up a little bit in the summer when you, everybody was in, and now we'll take a look at a few more um, opportunities or capabilities with AI. 
So as a reminder, um, thinking about AI, um, just like any technology, technology integrations and technology use can of course have like horror stories and um, examples of like misuse and, and some sad things happening. And technology can be used to help really help us increase our effectiveness in any career or any role that we're serving um, when we're using technology for good and for an um, effective reason to help us help us teach and learn in a better way. That is the goal. So we'll look at the um, AI in, in that light in this sense. Um, this definition is that it's a ability of a computer or other machine to perform activities that are normally thought to require intelligence. So we looked at uh, chat GPT previously, how it interacts in like a conversational, almost human-like way where it can chat back and forth. And some of that capability of AI is being baked into a whole bunch of other websites and resources. So AI isn't something that we can really block or shut down or prevent. It's it's here and it's being integrated into almost everything. And so we we knowing that, then how do we adjust? So today is kind of about um, refreshing our awareness and looking at like what you might do with that in the classrooms. Um, I do share this. These are some examples of predictive AI that maybe you've been experiencing. So for example, algorithms on if you pull up Facebook on one person's phone and you pull up Facebook on another person's phone, based on their interests, based on what they click on, what they like, what they read, what they um, what they view, their Facebooks are going to look very different um, just depending because it's going to use AI to generate a news feed that's interesting to that person based on their patterns of scrolling. So that's an example of AI in use that we've been accustomed to, or even like using some of the Google Maps features to drive us around that. Those are predictive AI features. Generative AI um, is what we'll look at next. And those are, that is the new ability for a system to create brand new information based on a prompt that we give it. So it does open up a bunch of questions um, as we have talked about previously too, but um, I would invite you to consider what do you notice and what do you wonder as we um, as we look at some of these examples of artificial intelligence. So what do you notice and what do you wonder? This is on ChatGPT and we could maybe use it as a brainstorming buddy or personal assistant. So here I put populate a list of meal plan ideas for a family with kids, or you could customize that request to um, a certain diet or a certain, um, certain type of request for food, for example. So we're using AI here in this case to be just a, a buddy to brainstorm with. So it gave a meal plan list. And I'm like, okay, cool. We'll have to turn that into a grocery list. And it does. So it took that whole meal plan and populates a grocery list. And so think about in education, how it, you can take an activity and have it create a materials list or vice versa. Here, I scrolled back up and I was curious to have it tell me more about the smoothie bowls. Just curious what that really is and what it entails. So then it generated a brand new recipe here or a recipe to support that request. And after it went through the list of what to do and how to make it, then I asked, um, well, is this recipe even delicious? And right, is this recipe actually delicious? And it comes back with yes. And it tells us why and it gives some justification. Now, obviously it might in fact be delicious and it might not be. So that is potentially a biased response. And you'll note that down here on the bottom of ChatGPT's website, it even says that it could produce inaccurate information. So knowing that we have to then look at anything that any site's ever feeding us um, through a lens of, is this accurate? Is this right? Is this um, okay? You know, is this bias? Is this on, on par? But knowing that AI has that capability to completely brainstorm from scratch and respond back and forth um, is the first thing to note that it's very different than a Google search where you go out and search something and get it and bring it and then that's it. Um, this can be refined and you can tweak and edit as it continues to give information. So. Yeah, I think another question to ask in education is, is it researched? And so um, whenever, like if we would be searching for some kind of um, 
an educational resource just to kind of think, okay, is that what my school is using? Is that research-based? And so you might want to bounce that off of teachers that you're working with to see, hey, is this in line with what we're doing here at school? Yes, that's a great point to make sure that it is um, generating information that would be aligned, right? Uh, this is another example, though, um, of it being like a learning guide. So it says, I'm an elementary para helping a student with science. Please refresh my memory on photosynthesis, for example. So it goes through and talks or spits out this information that might then help someone um, refresh their memory about that process. Now, you would have need to make sure that it's accurate, but it is a good starting point potentially. And then I asked, okay, we'll explain this in a third grade way. So it took that fairly large chunk and then simplified it even more so that maybe I as a learner could understand it differently or I as a facilitator of learning could re-explain it. With that information, I said, well, what are some prompting questions that I could ask students to help guide their thinking and learning regarding photosynthesis? It remembers what has previously been discussed. So here it goes through and um, populates some discussion questions that might be useful in a small group setting where you're helping facilitate a conversation for them. Um, then you could have it even summarize this into even more concise version so that if you need just a quick takeaway for yourself as a as a something that you're trying to learn or to get to the point. Um, so there it gives a little concise summary of photosynthesis. So make sure that it's accurate, make sure that it's right. But this is one of the abilities of AI. And this is just chat GPT that we're showing, but this ability to generate information like that upon request is um, available through a lot of other sites too. So. I don't know about you, JC. I bet you would agree that we've all been asked to teach something that we don't know a lot about, right? Yeah. Something mm -hmm. pops up in curriculum and um, you're like, oh, wow, I need some basic information on that for myself to like get myself up to speed on that topic. So I love this idea. Yes, it can be just a, I mean, we could Google that and read whatever sites are coming up there too. And this is just another opportunity. So yeah, good But idea. Google wouldn't have changed it into questions that you could ask the students and then a little summary and things like that. So. Right. Based on what you really need to get out of it. Like mm -hmm. they're, they're telling us like AI is going to be as valuable as we are able to prompt it. So the better prompt that you can ask and request um, helps mm -hmm. to get information you're looking for. This is a whole nother site though. This is Magic School AI. So this is not ChatGPT, but this is a AI tool that's geared towards educators and it has um, more of like the friendly interface that we'd be accustomed to on other sites with these like buttons, these gray chunks that you could then click on one of them to have it do XYZ topic. So the ability that this site has is very similar to ChatGPT, where it's generating brand new stuff based on what you ask it. But the this um, website here that it's scrolling through has a bunch of different options that are um, built right in here. So if you're new to exploring this site, um, there can be, you can get lost. There's a whole bunch of opportunities here. There's some fun ones like create a joke, a teacher joke generator and create a song you know there's a lot of uh, simple ways to use it there um, I would encourage you to collaborate with the teacher in the in the event that you would um, see this fitting but for example I did want to show one particular one which is a new part of this which is the YouTube video question generator so if you have if you go to magicschoolai.com and then you're on this site and you click this button, the video generator or question generator, it has you then pick a YouTube video. So say this dolphin one from National Geographic is in fact a video that I need to have students watch. You paste this into their site, pick what grade level. So I put fourth grade, I need 10, let's just say multiple choice questions for them to be asking. And there it goes on the right. It's generating a bunch of questions to support that 10-ish minute video about dolphins that could then be printed or turned into a Google form for their interactive 
Uh, there's other sites that do similar things, but if you are in charge of facilitating a group through watching something and need some questions to help them stay on track um, with the support of your classroom teacher that you're helping support, potentially this could be a way to help students engage a little more deeply with the video. This is just one example on Magic School AI, um, and you'd have to take it and explore what would be practical in your uh, various roles. But um, note too, when it gets to the bottom of these 10 questions, it does give you the answer key and it tells you what, what minute of the video it the answer can be found as well. So that is one, but going back to Magic School AI, I know that there's just a whole lot there. There's If any of you help coach like little kids soccer, for example, you can have it make a um, sports practice schedule. So it's um, got quite a bit on there for lots of different purposes. There Know that there is a lot of other AI tools for education, and this list was just a few that were um, brought up a couple of months ago, and there's more and more growing every day, and all, each of these tools are increasing in capacity literally um, week by week. So know that um, we've just shown you a couple today and that there's a lot of others that have capabilities, um, not just for education too, but there's a lot of other industries that are adapting to the integrations of AI. Like a travel one is, I can't remember what it's called. Maybe, I don't know if you, Steph, if you remember, but it was one where you can basically put in a destination and it will create an itinerary for you of where you could eat oh, and really what you could mm -hmm. do. And so there's a lot of other personal uses for AI as well. All right, so within your rooms or with whoever you are watching this with, or um, maybe to yourself, if you're watching it solo, um, what do you notice and what do you wonder about AI? Uh, the noticings that I often hear is like, wow, that's really fast. Wow, that seems cool for teachers. How do we adapt this for students? Um, I wonder what the future holds. You know, those are all good um, questions to be discussing and considering and know that everybody everywhere is adapting to how this changes the game for teaching and learning. And so thanks for taking time to think through a little more AI and what it can do and what that means. So we are going to go like, so that was like, what, so what, well, now what? Knowing that this is a capability and depending on whether you're working with um, younger students or older students, some classroom considerations to keep in mind. Um, the first would be to check with teachers. So when um, when there's either students wanting to use AI or when you're wanting to use AI or when um, any AI related things, I would just recommend following the guidance of the teachers. And typically what I've been hearing a lot of schools is having, teachers are having the discretion to decide either per class or per assignment, even if the integration of AI is appropriate or acceptable in that case. And so sometimes they'll say yes on this, you can, or no on this, you can't. So just be in communication with the uh, lead teachers to know what their stance is, and it can change per assignment even potentially. This is an example of a guide that some schools have used. So they students ask, um, well, why do you wanna use AI? And if they say they want to help get started on an assignment, then maybe the answer from the school would be that, yes, they could use it to get started, like prompt some ideas or to help improve on what they've already done. Maybe the answer is yes. Now, I'm not saying this is right and true and how you have to do it, but this is just an example of a one page document that is out there that could be an option. So maybe if they're asking to explain an idea in simpler terms or in a different way, perhaps it's just fine that they learn it and hear it. Um, through an AI chatbot, perhaps. Now, if the student is saying, I want to fully do my whole assignment for me, and then then no, if you would tell them no, that that's not appropriate. Or if you want them to find research or facts or quotes from AI, then that would not be appropriate. So on these no ones, sticking on this side, um, no, if the AI is doing the work for them, they're missing the learning, try another approach. And if the AI it's important to know that AI chatbots or any site can hallucinate or when doing research, it can just randomly make things up. So not only is it might be biased, but it might just like make up something. And that's what they're calling um, hallucinating or generating made up or incorrect information. So knowing that we have to be aware of that is one step. And then 
back here on the yes. So say they ask a question, can they get started on assignment? And you said, the teacher said yes, they can use it to throw some basics. Then maybe from there, they need to ask the teacher and check with the handbook to ensure that that's acceptable. Um, they perhaps need to use an appropriate tool and then track their work. So they need to be able to show where they got the starting points from. Um, double check the work for hallucination and bias, as we said, and then um, cite the AI tool that's been used um, when they get to the final project. So these are this is just one example of how um, school, there's a whole look at it, of how some schools may be approaching it or how some classroom teachers or how it might be dependent on the teacher, might be dependent on the unit or the even daily assignment. So just know that like when we're considering um, how this impacts your classrooms, check with those teachers and um, you're always welcome to have them reach out to the ESU or us to help talk through the conversations that this brings up. Um, so what are you excited about um, or at the same time anxious about in this work? As we look at all these capabilities and possibilities for us as adults or just in general with education, hopefully there's some like peaked interest on some of the great tools that can really um, enhance teaching and learning. And it's okay to recognize the feelings of a little bit of hesitancy or nervousness with what this really looks like and how it changes things. So I'd invite you to have that conversation with in your groups or with those around you. Steph, I don't know if you have. No, I to... love the tip about going back and talking to the teachers and even you might be sharing some resources that they haven't heard about too. So uh, you might be asking them, have you heard that you can do this with AI or, oh, we have to teach this unit coming up. We'll wonder what AI would say about that. So um, you know, you might be taking back a resource that they they don't know very much about too. So, yeah, that's a great point that I feel collectively, a lot of us are all in the like awareness stage of like what is even out there and what, so yeah, parents are now informed and can <laughs> take that and share. So mm -hmm. thanks. yeah, feel free to pause this recording um, and talk about it in your group if you're watching with a group right now. Um, but if not, we'll just keep on rolling. Cool. Um, with this quote, the future belongs to those who learn more skills and combine them in creative ways. So kudos again to all of you for taking time to learn and hear more about AI tools and some password tools earlier, password um, best, mean, best practice um, ideas. So with all these tech things swirling in your mind, know that um, you should be commended for taking the opportunity to learn and then knowing that like now you can go out and um, use what you've heard in a creative way that helps helps us down the road. So I would love to visit more soon. So please email or please reach out or please stop me in the hall if you see me at your school or um, or anything of that nature. We just um, want, want to remind you that um, our para series continues all year. Um, today, we're talking about artificial intelligence, but on your surveys, you also mentioned um, that you'd like some help with some behaviors. So in December, um, we're going to work on um, positive relationships and how relationships can help us with um, behaviors. And um, then in February, we'll talk about de-escalation strategies. So when kids get pretty amped up, how can we help bring them back down um, and calm them? And in April, we'll work on some small group facilitation tips because I know a lot of parents are working with small groups. Remember that all of these are recorded. So um, even if you're busy with students at the time, you can always access the recordings. All of our resources, recordings, the Zoom link um, is at bit.ly slash paras of ESU8. And that's our just our site that we've had for a long time. Even if you're thinking, gosh, I'd like some information on, um, uh, you know, a topic that isn't being held this year, look and see maybe we've, we've done that topic in the past and you can access it right there. Um, and you can also access our... Um, slides presentations and look through and get all the information. So, but most of all, just go ahead and email anytime you have questions. Um, we're here for you. 
And um, our our role really is to serve our schools. So um, we're free help. Um, you can reach out anytime. I love it. That's awesome. What a great uh, library of resources available to Paris. So kudos for the years of putting together great information. And thanks, thanks again. Yeah. For well, thanks, Paris. Um, get out there and try something new. Just just jump on, try one little bit of AI, even for your own knowledge or to create your shopping list, right? For next <laughs> week. Um, I'd love that that option there. Um, but uh, we appreciate your time today and we hope that you do have a great day and we will see you um, next time in December. Sounds good. Take thanks. Care.